So William Smith goes to Stowey, which is just the next town over off the map, meets with Lady Jones. She gives him a place to live at high, near High Littleton, near what was known as the Mearns Colliery, one of the main coal mines on her property. And to the west of this line, each of these little stars represents a colliery or a coal mine. You'll notice that they stop very abruptly. That's because there's an angular unconformity, Triassic and other Mesozoic rocks covering the older rocks here and dipping back towards London to the southeast. So William Smith uh, worked in this area, first lived on Rugborn Farm, which is this uh, two-story or three-story building that was owned by Lady Jones that Gave him, this, gave him this place to live on a horse. That was here near High Littleton. And as you go down this little country lane from High Littleton, there's a sign that says to Rugborn Farm, which is off to the left, where William Smith, father of English geology, lodged from 1792 to 95. And in his own writings, of which there are few, he talks about this as being the birthplace of the ideas that took him where they took him. When we were there two years ago, we did two trips. Did a student trip that took 10 days, and Tom went with us on that. Then they flew home, and then there was a group of BYU alums, and Jay was on that group, Jay Gatton was in that group. We went and did that loop a second time. And when we got to Hyde Littleton the first time, beautiful sunshine, when we were there with you, I think it was raining that day, but there was a, a family understanding the historical significance of this house has taken it over. He himself is an architect. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands they spent refurbishing it, but it looks just like it did. They've kept, they've left as much of the original stone floors and other things in there that they had that, as they possibly could. So, and, and if you go there, you know, they're very, very cordial. You know, you can imagine have a bunch of people come up to your house, you know, because you live with William Smith. You, you might get a little bit crabby, but they're really, really nice. At least they were two years ago. So he worked in the collieries. So here's, here's Rugborn Farm. Took his horse across to the Mearns Colliery. And he would rattle down in the ore bucket. And as he did, he paid very careful attention to the strata that he saw as he descended. One of the things he noticed is he descended first, it started in red clay, called a red marl. It looks like a lot like the Moen Kopi, this red, red shale siltstone sand. And they were very, almost horizontal as far as he could tell. Then you get to this one section, and it changed very dramatically. The rocks were tw twisted, tilted, had coal in them. He crossed an angular unconformity. And he paid attention to that and mapped out the different coal beds and really paid attention to what the miners had said because they knew the coal seams almost like they were family. They knew them intimately. This is the, this is the uh, king's toad or the number nine or the, you know, whatever. And in each case, because they're in Pennsylvania cyclothems, there was an order to the strata that repeated themselves in each of the, or most of the coal seams. Help there. I think. Well, here's this is from 1890, so long after Smith, you know, a century later. But but anyway, um, what an awful way to make a living. We went to Radstock, a town nearby, and they have a wonderful coal museum. They had a display there on children in the coal mines, and had a list of all these children that died. You know, you're, you're 10 years old, and you, you're down underground 15 hours a day in the pitch black, opening a door so the coal bucket comes through when the bell rings. You know, it's just horrendous. Ah, uh, shoot. <laughs> okay. What I'm trying, what I was hoping to show here, almost 80 years before, a fellow that lived here and worked in the coal mines or owned some land named John Strachey had drawn a section and had sort of recognized these things that Smith was recognizing. In fact, perhaps Smith, it, it seems possible or probable that Smith had this diagram that Strachey had drawn and really sort of took off from that. So maybe he, he, he was piggybacking on, on uh, the cross-section from the Mearns Colliery that was made in 1716. So um, he, he became very well known for the great work that he was doing in the, in the colliery. 
the folks in the Somerset Coal Basin needed to get their coal to market. And that meant they needed to get the coal to the Bristol Channel so they could get it to London and other big cities. And in order to do that, it was far too costly to carry it over ground. So there was a Coal Canal Act that was passed in the late 17, in the 1790s that, that paid for two parallel canals that went along the Cambrook, one along Wellowbrook. They would meet up at Midford, then go on to the Avon Canal and to the Avon River and off to market. So when that Coal Act was passed by King George III, William Smith was invited to be the surveyor for the canal company. So now he went out of the employ of Lady Jones as a coal miner, a coal prospector, and became the surveyor for the coal canal company. And so he would come out, still lived at Rugborn, would come out on his trusty horse from High Littleton. They started here near Camerton and then started working their way uh, eastward. And he was hired by no less than John Rennie, who was the, built iron bridges and really was one of the movers and shakers of the industrial age or the industrial revolution. And one of the things that he uh, was asked to do as a member of this, as the surveyor, was to accompany a couple other gentlemen on a long 900 mile circuit across England looking at different coal mines, looking at, at uh, canals, looking at uh, locks, looking at caissons, looking at ways to move the boats and keep the water in. But he had a secret as he went along because he had seen a pattern in the little area where he'd worked, this pattern of contorted coal beds that had a real order to them. And then he noticed that there was an order above that. And he thought, maybe this, ex how would this extend from this point around the world? Would these rocks that are gently dipping back towards London continue underneath the continent of Europe? Well, to be able to determine that, I need to be able to trace them across the countryside. And so as he was on this trip to ostensibly look at coal and canal workings, he was secretly taking notes of where the different strata that he was familiar with by then, where they cropped out and found that they were right where he would predict they would be. And uh, there's sort of a, a, an apocryphal story that talks about being up on the top of York Minster with these gentlemen and showing the landscape and being, the, being able to point out the different formations just by their geomorphology. Anyway, so they go on this 900-mile trip, get back, and then they start work on the Somerset Coal Canal. This is the Valley of Cambrook, looking to the west, looking to the east. How much rock do you see? Yeah, I mean, it's not like we're mapping southern Utah where you can see every stratum, right? So, I mean, this took a little bit of industry and effort. And you can see how opening up the countryside was just essential. And as they, they worked their way through along the, the edge of the, the uh, valley, opening it up, uh, William Smith was there taking note of every stratum. Then he noticed the fossils in there. And the reason he wanted to really take careful note of each stratum was because they were going to do the same thing just over the hill later. And if he understood how quickly you could excavate through this formation or that layer or whatever, and if this would hold water, or we'd be losing water through porous sands, then he could predict and better work on that next one. He was very applied, very practical. So he made a table of his strata here in sort of glorious colored fashion from an 1860, uh, 1816 uh, publication. But you know, here they were. He just noticed starting at the bottom that went up through and there were these very distinctive strata. And he was doing it based on differences in rock types. So he was the first lithostratigraphy. In 1795, having made a little bit of money from his employment, he moved from Rugborn Farm and moved to this uh, sort of three-story walk up in a, in a little crescent that's just to the south of Bath overlooking the town to the north on the margins of the Avon, Avon Valley. And he lived here from, or had occupancy here from 1795 to 1798. But he spent most of his days down here and uh, along the, the canal cuts in fact, Dunkerton, which is this beautiful little village that I just showed you. See, this is, I, I actually went online and found 
that there was a property overlooking Dunkerton that was on sale for two and a half million dollars a couple of years ago. And I, my department, you know, I was a department chair at the time, but I thought, you know, I probably would have a hard time saying we really need this as a re research facility. But isn't that just beautiful? I just, but here's the little town of Dunkerton, and where the old Roman road, the Fossway, crosses it is an inn known as the Swan Inn. And here's the trace of the canal, and this is the early 1900s. We go there today. Now, would have gone through here. Here's the Swan Inn, and this is important in geology because you can imagine it was a relatively cold Tuesday on January 5th in 1796. Even though his residence was the Cottage Crescent, Crescent, he was staying at the Swan Inn because, you know, maybe it was too cold to go all the way into home that night or he had early pressing. Anyway, that night, he, he jotted down in his notes that fossils have long been studied as great curiosities, collected with great pains, treasured with great care, and at a great expense, and showed admired with as much pleasure as a child's rattle or a hobby horse has shown, and admired by himself and his playfellows because it's pretty. What he was alluding to were all the fancies and dandies that would have fossil cabinets, so when they'd have soirees and people come over, they'd, you know, ooh and ah over their fossil cabinet. And then he goes on to say, and that's been done by many thousands who had never paid attention in the least regard to the wonderful order and regularity with which nature has disposed of these singular productions and assigned each class its particular stratum. So again, he's, he has on his lithostratigrapher hat. He's not doing biostratigraphy. He's saying, here are these rock units. Oh, but guess what? Each of these rock units has its particular fossil assemblage. And that was the talisman that he had. That was the secret he had in his toolkit, that he could then recognize strata all across England and correlate back to Bath based on the fossils. So we see that as early as 1796. In 1798, feeling again a little bit you know, wealthier, he quits the, the renting in the, in the uh, Crescent, Cottage Crescent, and buys a property right along the path of the canal at a place called Tucking Mill. So the canal, if it was still here, would be right about where you're sitting, and then a stone's throw from it is this, and then off to the left is what's called the Tucking Mill Cottage. And Tom and Jay, when we walked along that, the, the canal path, we, we came out at this point, and here's this lovely little house, and you go up to this plaque. And it says, here lived William Smith, father of English geology, born 23rd March 1769, died August 28, 1839, re-erected in 1932 by the Geological Society of London, Bath Royal Literary Scientific Institution. They put the plaque on the wrong house. <laughs> But if you go over here and then up a little, just a little lane, is where you find Tucking Mill House. But the, and they, I, I'm pretty sure they know now that this is not the place, but they still refuse to remove the plaque and put it on the right house. So William Smith had a scheme right up the hill. He brought some acreage right up the hill where there were outcrops of the inferior oolite or the lower Jurassic oolites, which were building stone and important stone, and he was going to quarry it. He had a crew build a narrow gauge railroad down to the front, the, to the canal, and then the canal company felt like, I'm not, it's not really clear what happened. Maybe they were thought he was double dipping or a conflict of interest, but they summarily fired him in 1799, and thereafter he never held down a job in one place. He was basically a consultant living from hand to mouth the rest of his life. Almost. But he had this property that he was on the hook for that he'd mortgaged from uh, a guy named John Conley at Mitford Castle nearby. But anyway, so this was uh, his residence from 1798 to 1818, although he didn't spend all of that time there. So there's not, you, you go today to, you want to look at the canal, there's not much left because when, about 100 year, over 100 years ago, they decided that that was an efficient way to move it, so they put, used these grades as train tracks, replaced to lay the tra um, railroads. 
And the, rail, the railways ended about 50 years ago, much to people's chagrin, because you know the, the county line was sort of a, a big, big deal. Anyway, here's what it looked like going through Dunkerton. Here's really basically the only thing that's left. Just before you get to the Avon Somerset Canal, there's a little piece of this body of standing, standing water. And there are canal boats on it, and there are canals in other places, and there's this whole cult subculture in England of people who buy these canal boats and live on them and work on the canals. Okay, so what did William Smith see? Here's the red marl. Doesn't look like, except for the vegetation, looks like Utah, doesn't it? Overlying that is the blue lias, a Jurassic marine unit. Overlying that, the inferior oolite. Oh, by the way, his the as as Simon Winchester says, the oolite that William Smith had purchased was inferior more than just its stratigraphic position, and that went bust, and he was on the hook financially for that. It just didn't have the qualities that people would purchase. This is Dun this is Dundry Hill, and. Uh, William Smith met some acquaintances that had some, some clout, uh, two reverends, Joseph Townsend and Benjamin Richardson in Bath, who were fossil, amateur fossil collectors. They, they met at some local meeting, and he then went over to Reverend Townsend's home. He said, he sought to show him his fossils. He said, let me organize these in the order in which they're found in the earth. So he took a couple hours, laid them out in their stratigraphic order, and Richardson couldn't believe it. He said, are you sure? And he goes, okay, let's do, let me, let me, let's do a test. On Dundry Hill, so here's Bath over here. On Dundry Hill, if I project the layers dipping to the southeast, projecting into the hill, here's the, here are the fossils you should find at the summit of Dundry Hill and on the facing slope. So he got in a carriage, took a day's journey out, went up Dundry Hill, and just almost like clockwork at the precise levels that William Smith said they should be there, they were finding fossils. And these two guys were just amazed. So they went back to Bath, to Great Pulteney Street, and on December, it's actually, um, there's a plaque here. So this was the, the, the residence of Richard Townsend or Joseph Townsend, and they had dinner there, and after dinner, till about midnight, they took up three big sheets of paper, drew lines on it, and William Smith said, okay, the number, stratum number one of 23 is this, and here are the properties, and here are you know, the fossils, and so on. And so they produced three of these like sheets. So it's actually, uh, think, they were thinking it was actually probably around June 11th, although the plaque on the outside of the door here at number 29 uh, says December 1799. So these two gentlemen understood the significance of this order in these fossils that, that William Smith had uh, established. So here again, um, and I wish it was big enough for you to see the norms like the, the Fuller's Earth, the Corn Brash, the Clench Clay, I mean just these bizarre, bizarre terms. But, and then in much later he finally published these and so he had some, an artist do these really detailed sketches, and he had them watercolored on sheets of paper that had the same essential color as the strata in which you would find them. So if you took this out as a field guide, you'd have the color of the strata, and they would use hues, they would use pigments out of the actual clays and things to do the, the brushing. So here's, here are the fossils from, say, the Fuller's Earth. You can see the red arrow over there. And then if you jump up to the upper oolite, different fossils. If you go to the coral rag and pyzolite, those fossils, the oak tree clay, those fossils. So he laid them all out in excruciating detail. This was a recurring theme. When he went into business with a fellow named Jeremiah Cruz as surveyors from 1802 to 1805, they rented or leased this locality along Trim Bridge, Trim Street, and this archbow window, he had racks set up and he had his fossil collection from the canal set in stratigraphic order. He also, there were some storms that breached the Suffolk coast and, and storm waves pushed water five miles inland. And they had tried to ameliorate the, the situation by, by putting man-made, you know, blocky rock walls and other things that just kept getting pulled out. So they called William Smith in 
And he said, what you need to do is just slope, get sand and slope it like the original coast because Mother Nature you know, is going to shape it that way anyway. And so he became known as a drainer, as a seacoast engineer. He worked on, on farms, draining properties. He was known as a drainer. He was known as a mineral surveyor, paleontologist. So he not only worked with people that were digging the fuel for the Industrial Revolution, he also worked with the farmers that were feeding the people that were stoking the fire. So he was very astute and very acquainted with the land from an agriculture, from engineering, from geology, paleontology. I mean, just a real, I mean, applied guy, which got him in, sort of got him in trouble. Okay, so in 1890 or 1799, Taylor and Naylor publish a book called Historical and Local New Bath Guide. And on the back of it, there's this circular map, five miles in, in diameter, of Bath and its region. He took that map. This is the original that's now at the uh, Geological Society of London. It's been varnished a few times, and the varnish has sort of tinted it. But trying to sort of peer through it, this is what the first geological map that he made looked like in 1799. No lines of contacts that we call. What he would do was paint the bottom of the formation a dark tint and then have it sort of the color of the rock and then have that sort of lighten towards the base of the next one. And then the base of the next unit is dark and lightened. We see three units here, the red marl, the blue lias, and then the inferior oolite. So you had three units. You can see where the Avon River cuts down. You can see the topography represented where the valleys cut down through the overlying oolite into the underlying blue lias and so on. And then in 1801, he made an attempt, based on the John Kerry base map, to trace the units that he was familiar with that he'd seen on his great circle, plus all the collieries and other things. And then people would call on him and say, I have this, new, I have this property that I just got over here. And it has this really dark black shale on it that I think is coal. Should I prospect here? And he'd say, no. The, the Oxford clay, these other clays, don't have coal. They're black. They're maybe carbonaceous. But you're just not in the right place. It doesn't fit the pattern. You need to be over in here. And they wouldn't believe him. And people would you know, go in and other people would say, oh, yeah, let's dig all this stuff. And they'd make all this money off these property holders without having, you know, and he could have told them. Without even going there, they weren't going to find it because he, he understood the strata. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really have to rush through this. But um, in 1807, this newfangled society with 13 members, the Geological Society of London, starts up, and they have their first meeting in the, uh, in the Mason's Hall, Freemason Hall. And then uh, in 1807, but it, within a few years, the society um, finds itself housed at Somerset House on the Thames River. And it branched off the Royal Society, much to the president of the Royal Society, Sir Joseph Banks, chagrin because he wanted to keep them all in one society and he didn't want the Geological Society breaking off. But off they went. But at one of these uh, sort of agricultural meetings, Sir Joseph Banks was introduced to William Smith and told what the things he could do. And so Banks started underwriting him. But William Smith had a hard time publishing are really settling down. But imagine, you, you have all these things you've been working on for 10 years, and you see the patterns, and you want to publish it. Where do you publish it? How do you do it? What, what it what's the best way to document what you've just done? So he gets with a group, a publisher named DeBretz, prom, writes a prospectus on a publication that sort of outlines this stuff, starts getting subscriptions, but then he gets busy because he's not employed anywhere. And if somebody says, come look at Norfolk Shore or come to my farm and drain, he has to go because he has to make a living. He gets married in 1808 to a woman named, uh, first named Mary Ann, who then goes spectacularly crazy. So he has this wife that he never stays with her, very faithful to her, that he has to take care of, who's going insane. He has a young nephew, John Phillips, who comes to live with him around 1808 who becomes a geologist, and Paleozoic, Mesoic, Cenozoic are names that John Phillips gives us. He becomes an Oxford professor much later. So he's got this family now. He doesn't have any full-time job, full-time work. He's traveling 10,000 10, miles a year, much of it on his own dime, mapping as he goes, 
piggybacking on traveling to do consulting work. Can you imagine trying to keep that up for very long? And then William Banks gives him a subscription, sees the value of the map, gets people to subscribe to it. William Smith doesn't publish, sort of, he becomes a little bit disillusioned and later sort of comes to his rescue again. And even more august than Sir Joseph Banks, lecturing at Somerset Hall or Somerset House, Tom, on our, on our trip. Okay, so he has the property at Trimbridge. He has the property at Midford or at uh, Tucking Mill. He then gets a property in London, which was probably ill-advised because he just didn't really have the money to do it. Moves his wife family in, brings the specimens from Trimbridge, reestablishes them in stratigraphic order in this house, which otherwise was not completely furnished, and tries to insinuate himself into the affairs of the learned people at the time, and specifically geological society, who comes and visits here, but then leaves and doesn't want anything to do with them, doesn't give him any accolades, but starts to steal the work that he's done already. Because the geological society, you know, these high, you know, pollutant people, we need a, a national map. They had no idea how to do it. When they'd go out in the field, they would go in carriages, stay at a really nice hotel, and then they'd get farmers and post hole diggers and mole catchers to come in and tell them what they see. And then if they needed to go spot check anything, they might go out and get their boots dirty. And Smith, you know, is doing all this traveling and out there getting his hands dirty all the time. Well, this is sort of an interesting place. Um, so this is, this is right on the, the Thames River is here, although there's an, a bank or a park that's been built there. When Smith lived here, the river was just down this set of stairs right, right here. This is all, it, it's been rebuilt, unfortunately, but this is what the building probably looked like at the time, number 15 on the corner. Um, what's the guy, what's that guy, Tale Two Cities? Oh yeah, Dickens. He lived here for a period of time in the same, same place. So there's a plaque now. Sir Richard Edinburgh put a, Attenborough put a plaque on here saying that Smith lived there back on his birthday in March of this year. So from 1803 to 1815, this is sort of where, where he, his residence is. Here's Somerset House, and here's the guy who was uh, the, the main pilferer of the geological map, was the George Bellas Greenoff. His name was George Bellas, but he had a rich uh, grandfather who made his millions off of selling snake oil, and he said, I will give you my fortune if you change your name to Greenoff from Bellis, which he was pleased to do. And then he was a founding member of the Geological Society, you know, which was really a rich dining club of, of gentlemen. And here's the cruel part. Here's number 15 Buckingham Street. Here's Somerset House. It's literally, literally for William Smith, a five minute, 10 minute walk, but they didn't want anything to do with him. They wouldn't allow him to join their club because he was too lowly born and too poorly married. And he was a practitioner, he had to work for his living. He would, plus he didn't believe in some of the teachings of, of uh, Neptunism that was coming from the continent. Well, finally in 18, 1815, which is what we're celebrating this year, uh, his map of England is published by John Kerry, who lived just a couple houses down between him and Somerset House on the Strand. And it's six feet by eight feet, if you've seen it, and it came in 15 pieces, 15 sheets. And this is even a miniature of it. And I think this is from the APG, right? Okay. So Tom got this one over in England, but I mean, be, I've, I have an, a smaller version of the 18, his 1820 map that's framed on, in hanging on my wall in my office, but uh, just an amazing piece of work, all, made all the more amazing by the fact that it was hand colored. So Kerry put the, did sort of put the lines and then William Smith had to come in and, and watercolor. Um, and there, um, there are hardly any um, copies of it existing. Here's the, uh, so it had, okay, what do we have on a geologic map? We have the formations and contacts, rock units. We have the key. He also had on there um, lead mines, copper mines, tin mines, et cetera, to make it more useful for everyone. And then here is the 1819 map that came out under the auspices of the Geological Society of London, much of what, which was pilfered from the 1815 map. In fact, the uh, Geology Society has maps of these that were owned by Greenoff that has annotations saying, okay, we're done with this one, essentially meaning we've gotten all the information off here we can. 
And one of the reasons it was a problem is that William Smith was going to make his living off of selling these maps, which went from, for, from five pounds, and then if it was mounted and really nicely framed, 12 pounds, 24 bucks. How much do you think you'd have to pay for one of these originals nowadays? Yeah, it'd be nice to have one, wouldn't it? But many of the subscriptions that Smith was hoping would come in didn't come in because people had heard that the Geological Society had a map coming out, so they withheld their... In fact, some, one person that got one of these brought it back and said, oh, I thought I was getting one of those. Plus the other thing that you have to have on a geological map are cross sections. And I forgot to bring, but APG has published a big, some big posters like that that show the wall colored watercolor cross sections that went with Smith's map. So it's all the, all the parts of a geologic map that we use today. Oh, here's some of the cross sections. Aren't they gorgeous? I mean, that's just art. He also did a series of county maps. This is Oxfordshire. If you go onto the internet and look up William Smith's Maps Interactive, the Geological Society of London has pieced together all of the county maps that were done, and they call it the map that would have been. Had Smith continued and had their backing and whatever and had the resources, it is just cool. I mean, it really just, it, it, it makes this map look like sort of just a, a, what, a rough draft. It's really cool. Uh, so by 1819, his traveling, his wife taking care of his nephew, his map not selling, um, having Midford, the, the, the owner of Midford Castle calling in his markers, William Smith for 11 weeks goes to debtor's prison at the King's Bench Prison, again about a half hour's walk from his residence and from where, you know, John Carey's place where his, his stardom and where his, you know, in, in the Somerset house and Anyway, so 11, for 11 weeks, he's here in debtor's prison. In 1819, he gets out, grabs his wife and his nephew, and they get on, the, on, get on the Great North Road and head north, and he never goes back to London for any period of time thereafter. And he lives the rest of his years, which is about, so this is 1819, so he still has about 20 years. He's 50 years old at the time. Goes to York, goes over to the coast, Scarsboro, where beautiful, there's beautiful outcrops of Jurassic rocks along the coast here. Where that belt comes out. And he's already done some work on the coast. He's done some work for farmers there. He's well known. They know he's the one that made this map. And a wealthy minister of parliament, James John Johnstone, takes him in onto his estate at Hackness and allows him to live there for about six or seven years. And uh, he does it sort of as an honor to his, his custodian there. He makes this beautiful map of Hackness property, the last geological map that he ever made. And uh, he is asked in the late 1820s, 1828, to help erect a museum in Scar Scarborough. And it's that rotunda. So he's in on the designing. It's made of hackneyed stone from John Johnstone's farm or land. They build it. And what do you think Smith does? He brings his fossil. Well, he, he has a new collection of fossils because to try and make money, he had to sell his 2,576 fossils to the museum, Natural History Museum, for a paltry 700 pounds overall over a period of three or four years, which keeps the wolves away from his door sort of intermittently, but finally by 1819 goes to prison. So this museum is built mainly under the auspices of John Johnstone for Smith, and he has his new fossil collection, and in this round rotunda museum, lines the walls with shelves and puts his fossils in stratigraphic order. I mean, does it seem like that's a theme? Seems like that's what his, his love. Here's what, here's what it looks like now. They've added some wings to it, and they now have a William Smith Museum. You can see a cross section of the strata there. Um, another round building that figured importantly, in 1832, he went to the Sheldonian Theater at Oxford, and Roderick Murchison presented him the first Wollaston Medal, which is awarded now by the Geological Society every year, and as uh, Simon Winchester aptly puts out, points out, this is the Nobel Prize of Geology, and the very first one went to William Smith. He was awarded or his announcement was awarded to him in 1831 at the Geological Society of London, in London, by the then president, Adam Sedgwick, 
but by the time the, the, the metal had actually been struck and was available, it was 1832, and that's why William Smith then traveled to Oxford, and it was the then president, Murchison, that actually presented it to him. And it's presented every year since. If you go to the Sedgwick Museum in Cambridge, you can see Charles Darwin's Wollaston Medal. Well, here's the museum today. Here's the inside. I haven't been here. I'd love to go here. Doesn't that look cool? You just go around. It's got the stratigraphy. It's got the fossils. It has some of the story behind William Smith and others. And he's also honored at Oxford University's Natural History Museum. Today is my 245th birthday, so that was back in March. And here, okay, so um, in 1839, he is traveling to Birmingham to the, I don't know, eighth or ninth British Association or British Association for the Advancement of Science, which was an august body that his nephew, John Phillips, helped this um, begin. And he was halfway, he was, I don't know, two thirds of the way there, got to Northampton, caught a cold, stayed with a friend, and over the period of the next two, three days, just went downhill. And there he died in 1839. And so this is uh, the, the uh, St. Peter's Church at, at Mayfair in uh, Northampton. And if you go inside, you have to go, there's, if you go just over here, there's a little, I think it's called the Red Lion Pub. If you go in there, they have this big old key and you can go over to the door and, and, and open it and walk in. And there's this bust, marble bust of William Smith in there. But this is his, this is his where he's interred out here just outside of, of the church. And James Secord, a historian of geology, said in 2010, those practitioners able to combine a range of disciplines under a new analytical order and apply them on a global scale are the most admired. I think that sums up William Smith. Started small, paid attention, was keen, knew, just you know, had a feel for the land that he developed through hard experience, saw a pattern, said, how far can I take this pattern? And he took it a long way. And so I think he, it's uh, deserving that Sedgwick said of him at that 1831 meeting, I present to you the father of English geology. And so that's where sort of that name came from. In 1870, long after Smith had died, the headquarters of the Geological Society moved to Burlington House. And when I went there the first time, you go through this door and there's a little door over here and you knock on it. As geologists sign, you knock on the door. It's almost like it's like a Wizard of Oz moment, you know, where the, Dorothy knocks on the door, you know, and they look out, and you know who's there, sort of looking down on you. They said, "Yeah, my name my name's Scott Ritter. I'm a geology professor in the United States at Brigham Young University, and my wife and I are here on holiday, and we we've come to see the map." And they just gave us this sideways look, like, "Why are you bothering us?" They said, well, we can't do it right now. There's nobody here that can show it to you. Could you come back at two o'clock? Okay, that could be worse. A lot of people have been turned away. So my wife and I went, got some fish and chips or you know something. Came back, knocked on the door. We got there at 2.05. You know, knocked on the door, the you know, thing opens and said, well, we're back. And they said, you're supposed to be here at two o'clock. Well, okay, but we'll let you in anyway. So we go in and walk back into a chamber back here, and there's a staircase that goes up to the library about here. And at the time, it was behind a blue curtain, you know, and you had somebody open the curtain for you. Nowadays, since uh, uh, Robert For uh, Forty, Forty, what's his first name, became president of the Geological Society, said, we're not going to, you know, there are all these people coming here to see the map. We're not going to be so rude. In fact, Let's not make them go through this sort of gauntlet of hate. Let's actually even, let's just open this door right here. And if people want to come in, we'll put the map there. It's not behind curtains. You can go in and you do, you walk through this door. And Tom went back a couple of weeks. I don't know, he had barely gotten over jet lag and went back to present a talk on, uh, on Eocene microbialites, right? And what, well, you got to just wander free through the whole place? And, yeah, and Mike did. So you got to see the map and they don't let you take pictures. Did you get pictures of it? Yeah, okay, I'll have to get them from you. <laughs> anyway, you go through this door. And unfortunately, when we were there with Jay on the first loop, they, it, nobody came, wouldn't let us in, so we didn't get to go in. But, but 
But if you go in, you know, here's the map hanging there, and then, well, next to it, um, this is the way it used to look behind the blue curtains that you hear about in lots of his book. But, um, anyway, here's the final map that he made in 1832 of the Hackness estate. You can see the lines, the contact lines. I looked high and low, but I wasn't able to find a colored version of it. But anyway, so uh, there's a sort of a quick summary of, you know, on celebration, bicentennial celebration of the publication of the map that uh, changed the world, I guess. So anyway, thank you. Uh, any questions? We've got to take them. If you, I'm sorry we went a little bit over time. So you got to run. You got to run. Sorry, Mark. Obviously started out being somewhat looked down upon by the Geological Society. Yeah. And then again, from what, 15 years later or so. Mm -hmm. So, what, what really happened to make the turnaround? How did they finally recognize him? Well, the Young Turks had sort of taken over the society. And Greenoff and these other 12 people that started it originally as a talking club and dinner club um, and high society thing where you just extol the virtues of Herr Werner from the continent and Neptunism and things. Geology, with the Industrial Revolution taking place, geology really became, had to become more in the hands of the practitioners. And so they were a little more willing to, to recognize that this low, lowly born person had actually done something useful. So um, it, was Hack, it was Sir John Johnstone from Hackness that got in touch with the Geological Society and said, you know, you know who I have living with me? You really need to do something. And so, um, Sedgwick and Murchison and others then that were in, in, in uh, ascendancy or in control said, yeah, we need to do something. And so, uh, and then they gave him a hundred pound, hundred pound a year uh, pension. And, and uh, so he died in 1839. His wife then went to a mental institution. She died about five years later. So then John William Phillips went on to, oh, I can't remember his first posting. I think it was in Ireland and then got after, uh, then back to uh, Oxford. Where he finished his career. Other questions? Okay, um, there's some good books. Um, the Map Changed the World, if you haven't read that. A guy named John Morton has one out called uh, Strata How William Smith Drew the First Map of the Earth and Inspired Science of Geology. Uh, John Phillips in 1844 published a memoir, The Memoirs of William Smith that left out a lot of stuff like him being in prison, anything about his wife. So it's sort of, it doesn't have all the detail you need. And there are other papers, but it, you know, if you're interested or have piqued your interest at all, you know, I wish we, I, I really wish you were giving me the 250, or the, what's Bill Clinton get, 500,000 to talk? I wish you were giving that to me because I'd say, well, let's get a, let's get a charter and go over it. Cause through the rest of this year in 1815, there are field trips and Bicentennial things at, at the different museums, different William Smith sites. It'd just be a great time to, to be over there and hanging out. But, okay, well, thank you, and see you next time. Well, thanks, Scott, for a great time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Well, that's a lot more important. And there, the map is here if anyone wants to see it. Yeah, that's good. So, did he have any sense of the real age of the rocks? No, he yeah. didn't care. He didn't know how they got that way. I never really thought about it. Yeah, not not really. He was too busy applying it to really worry about it. He talked about maybe the Earth's axis, you know, it was rotating. This was still pulpy and sort of centrifugal force sort of morphed it that way. But no, I mean, no concept of tectonics evolution.